How's it going? Andrew here, and welcome back to the Creative Endeavor Podcast. This is a podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And in this episode, I've got a real treat for you. I'm talking with John Coleman, who's an amazing artist based in Arizona in the United States. Now, John specializes in Native American subject matter. He does incredible bronze sculptures, paintings, and drawings. And in every piece, he captures something unique, an emotion or a story. I've been really inspired by his work for a long while now. And I just think he's on another level in terms of his technical ability. He's a member of the prestigious Cowboy Artists of America group, as well as the National Sculpture Society. Now, I wanted to hear more about John's beginnings of his artistic journey and also what makes him tick creatively. We also reflected on what's going on in today's world and some of the ways that we might have to adapt, move and change with the times. This was a great conversation. I got so much out of it. I hope you will, too. So without further ado, here's John Coleman in The Creative Endeavor. Well, John, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome to The Creative Endeavor. Great. Good to be here with you. There are so many things I want to ask you and so many directions I want to take this conversation. Of course, I want to talk all about your art and hear about your story and and how you create your fantastic work. But first, if you don't mind, I've been asking a few artists this recently because it just happens to be what the world's going through right now, what's on everybody's mind. How are you guys doing over there in Arizona? How is the lockdown affecting you and and this current global situation? And what are some of your thoughts going into this? Well, personally, I I feel a little guilty because it's just too damn easy on me. You know, I mean, I don't uh, I'm working on a show for uh, November, October, November, 20 new pieces. And so I set aside all my regular shows anyway. And uh I just work in my studio every day. Uh, the only thing that I'm missing is my restaurants. I'm used to going out to the restaurant a lot, you know. But other than that, you know, it's it's no, no different. It's great, you know. You know, I'm just like anybody else, you know. I mean, I've got my political views on it and all that stuff, you know. And uh, But I think uh, in terms of having something like this happen in a lifetime, you know, the Spanish flu, uh, what, uh, uh, 1918, uh, it was the last time there was a pandemic like this. So in some ways, it's, uh, it, it has a cleansing effect of the mind. I mean, it's really tough on, on people that have gotten sick, people losing their lives, all this. But, the, but, the, but it's an experience that once you get through it, I think it changes you in terms of your perspective. And I think you, things get a little bit more real. Uh, the minutia becomes less important. Uh, their focus is on things that are bigger and grander. Uh, so to me, that's always the silver lining. Okay, so all that being said, this is a natural, organic part of being alive on the planet. You know, I'm only here for so many years, and uh, you know, it's just another experience. Mm. So, what do you, what do you, when you say you're, you know, kind of focusing and, and shifting to some of those bigger things? What are some of those things that you you think about? Like, how does that change your perspective in, in that situation? Oh well, you know, me personally, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, and I think most artists feel the same way uh, uh, when you past a certain point in your life, you know, I'll say 50, you know, you know, I turned 70 about six months ago. And so that was a benchmark, a psychological benchmark. And, um, as I deteriorate on one level, I'm growing on another, you know, so I'm, I am excited about the fact of the growth. I'm a little concerned about the deterioration part. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping my best work is in front of me. Uh, so, you know, how that would might tie into global events like a virus is, is that it's another, uh, concept that, that's come to me in my life that um, that I have to deal with. Mm. Um, I think that's the key, you know, the key to everything, you know, in terms of uh, having really interesting problems in your life. Mm-hmm. Someone once said that every, everybody needs problems. It's just some people's problems are more interesting than others. The goal isn't get rid of your problems. The goal is to get more interesting ones. So the struggle of, of growing and, and getting better, and I think that's, Everybody has that issue. I mean, that doesn't matter what you do. It's it, it's just in this day and age with artists, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more obvious 
that growth is the thing that's on their mind, uh, becoming the, uh, a master, so to speak. You know, how how quickly can you shortcut that 10,000 hours you need in order to really be where you need to be? And will people appreciate what you've got? How now? You know, how do you get out there and get get up, get build that stage and then invite people into your theater, so to speak? You know, so that they give you feedback that makes you feel like you lived. Mm-hmm. You know, that you, you, your purpose is 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 mean something. You know, finding meaning to your life. Mm. I, yeah, I think so, I, I think that's a ticket, isn't it? I mean, I, I think for yeah. for so many of us, we're hungry for a sense of purpose and a, a hungry for that sense of direction. And sometimes something yeah. external like this can come yeah. in and just give it to you. Yeah, it, well, it adds a, it adds another perspective. I mean, it it, mm. it really does. And uh, um, I found in my life that uh, anytime anything that's happened that that's been um, a, a game changer. I mean, whether it's good or bad. Uh, I usually come out the other end feeling like I grew a little bit. You know, the concept of tr- uh, 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 trimming a tree, mm-hmm. you're actually cutting limbs off of an of an of an organic plant, and it grows stronger. You know, being pruned uh, isn't always a fun thing to do. You know, so they're, they're, everybody's everybody gets into these sorts of things, and they understand what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, if your life is is uh, you know, like you go back to the Middle Ages or the or the Dark Ages, you know, they, they say that sometimes people would live a whole life without even getting a name. You know, they may have only had one change of clothes. They may not have gone more than 20 miles from where they were born. Uh, you know, wow. I went back and visited where my, my uh, grandparents were buried, and I realized that, that they hadn't ever traveled more than 50 miles from where they were, where they were born. Um, you know, the concept of how long the road is opposed, opposed to how wide it is, you know, I'm driving home and I'm thinking to myself, hell, I've lived, I live more in a year than they lived in a whole damn lifetime. You see, mm. well, you know, you take the good with the bad, you know, and uh, you celebrate that stuff and it gives you a perspective on it. And if you're going to bitch about something, uh, you know, if you've lived and you've actually had been pruned a little bit in your life, you know, you get a little more maybe philosophical about it, but you also appreciate what you have. You appreciate what you can do and, and how and what you have to share. You have right. a perspective on that. Mm. You know, I, I, I think uh, I think you and my father would have a lot to talk about as well. This sounds oh. exactly like like some of the things <laughs> he was telling me, um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and he, yeah. he's a wildlife sculptor from uh, and still yeah. still going, you know, and yeah, 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 yeah. And, and like you, I think I mean, like your work just it, it blows me away, man. It absolutely blows me away. I'm not just saying that like I, I and, and like you were saying before, you know, you hope that your best works uh in front of you, like, I'm excited to see what you're going to do next. I mean, I, I'm yeah. looking at this. I, I, I feel sorry for the people who are only listening to the audio version of this podcast and cannot see this fantastic background oh, that, that I'm oh, looking at here in, in oh, your oh. in your studio. It's it's unbelievable. Awesome. Yeah, this is actually my house. My studio is up on the hill. Oh, yeah. oh, right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Awesome. yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. let, 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 let me let me let, let's dive in. We'll, we'll get off. We'll get off the global crisis. I mean, it, it, but it's always interesting to hear people's perspective about how yeah. they're right. they're coping yeah. with it, dealing with it and kind of some of the angles that they're approaching this from. And, and I do think by and large that that is that is helpful for people to hear as many different perspectives as possible oh, there. Sure. Because, of course, well, actually, maybe one more thing uh, b- before we do move on. And, and maybe you might like to, to comment on this as well. I'm getting emailed from people from all, all over the place, uh, you know, where where I'm getting just comments, messages, prayers, all that stuff. Oh, I hope you're okay. I hope you're you're safe. I hope everything's all right. I just feel like going back to them. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate the love, the kindness, the support. I hear exactly where you're coming from, and I don't want to patronize or anything, but I just feel like going turn off the damn news. Like just yeah. if you can focus on something creative, <laughs> yeah. just yeah, yeah, yeah. shift your yeah. focus. Turn off the news. Yeah. Turn off that fear. Yeah, of course, of course. That's that's the thing. Um, uh, things like this happen. Um, when you consider um, how long uh, people live today, um, that becomes the biggest killer of all: the fact that we're actually so successful. Uh, we are our own natural disaster. Um, you know, you can go back a couple hundred years. I mean, I would have been dead two hundred years ago. Right. Um, but my subject is tribal uh, uh, people, you know, Native Americans. Uh, mm-hmm. The fact that I'm wearing glasses would probably have got me kicked out of the tribe, you know, had I been a, a Comanche or something, you see. So this, mm-hmm. the funny thing about it is, is that people, they're concerned, obviously. But you know, the fact that we have so much information mm-hmm. gives us, um, it's like a sense of responsibility just by virtue of the fact that we know the information. 
Mm-hmm. And I think it's in, I think it's good, but yet you if you haven't learned how to assimilate it and understand what what you're doing. When I when this thing comes about, I'm making judgment calls, of course. So, you know, I want to see what's political, you know, you know, in this country, you know, we have the two sides, we have the Dems and the Republicans. Yeah. And and it, and of course it becomes political. And they use this as a way to sort things out from and political posturing. All mm-hmm. right? Um, it, it, during the depression, uh, FDR had the, had the New Deal, and if, and economists have looked at that from the back end and went, you know what, maybe the country would have been better off if they didn't have it. But but during the time when he was doing this and he had the fireside chats and all, people people um, felt better about it. Mm-hmm. So really, that's what we're doing here is we're 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 having we're, we we have all of this stuff coming at us, and we can take it for what it's worth. But I've always thought of it as a way of taking responsibility. As soon as you know something, when I find, when I hear about somebody that's starving in, in a country in Africa, for instance, I can make a judgment call on that and I can take a responsibility for it or I can forget it. When I was a kid, I never heard those stories. Mm. See, see, my world was like this. Now my world is like this. And, and to take your point, you have to be able to be the gatekeeper though of what comes in yeah. and, and how big you, were, you want your world to be on that moment. You know, it's like the stock market, you know, at my age, you know, I mean, I have a, my retirement is, is in different things. Uh, I got out of the stock market, you know, uh, just in time. And yesterday I went in in a big way, you know, and I, th- and I looked at the, what the stock market was doing. Then, oh, well, you know, I mean, it, now it's down. The, yeah. the, it's all symbolic, though. You see, it all has to do with you. How are you going to deal with your emotions? Mm-hmm. And I yeah. think if in go, taking us back to the being an artist, the very product that you're trying to produce and pass off to somebody is your perspective and your point of view. I happen to be uh, interested in in the romance of things. I mean, but but at the same time, I don't want to be overly uh, cute about it or anything like that, or overly dramatic. And I like and I want to have hidden hidden ideas in my work. I want subtle things in my work. But I feel like you can't do that unless you actually are open to the world and you actually live in the space that everybody else lives in. So you become a filter or a screen for, for where you're at. People that I admire from the past, I can see where they live through their art, right? People that are just making stuff that uh, maybe on the heels of somebody else's work, uh, it's, it just becomes an object. There's no life in it. So you see, so, so in a way it's incumbent upon every artist to actually have a, a point of view and and every stage or decade in their life, they're going to grow and they're going to change. Mm-hmm. And you're going to see that in, in, in the work they produce. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, no, that's that's very interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we all. Yeah, it's 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 just it's just that point of view. It, again, it's that point of focus from which we we create. I, I'm fascinated by artists from um the past and i mentioned this in previous episodes artists like goya um Mm -hmm. who was creating things from uh, a perspective during um uh, the inquisition and 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 the the torment and the turmoil of society at that time and the horror that he captured and some of those um some of those uh paintings i mean they're so powerful they're so emotive and they're gonna live on yeah, yeah, and it's ironic in a way that uh, he didn't uh, ha- he didn't have a he had a style of painting that was a little ahead of its time at that point. It was mm-hmm. simpler than his than his peers, uh, but it gave him it offered that uh, spontaneity that he needed to be able to paint like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the other part of it, and it's the difference between writing a symphony and maybe a, a quartet. You know what I'm saying? It's a, there's a point where you can just get it down. Uh, I probably wouldn't be able to do that. You know, I'm looking at my work. I, I, I'm, I'm looking for the, for the hook in my work is that little subtle thing that you almost need a, a special pass to get to find it inside the work. You know, yeah. Goya, was, it was like, boom, you know, you walk up to one of his pieces and bang, you know, there, boom, there it is. It just you know, and that, yeah. it just hits you. And, and that, I think that's, that's very exciting. And I think every artist, as they evolve, they need to find their, their, their heroes and their mentors and, and, choose which path they're going to take you know we're we're all on different roads yeah yeah i 
Look, I, I, I want to I want to do a deep dive here, uh, John, into your into your work because I just again I'm a huge fan. I've been looking at your work for many many years. I've been aware of you for for many many years. Um, let's let's go back to when you first started. When did you first realize that you wanted to be an artist? That this was something that you wanted to take on, you know, full time. That this was your life's yeah. mission. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, when I, as I tell you my beginning and how I started, I feel like I'm telling you the story of every artist that started. You know, I mean, we all come from that same place. Uh, I'm a big believer in uh, embracing your insecurity, number one, all right? And, you know, I mean, that's the whole thing. The more aware you are, the more you, you realize how deficient you are, right? You, and and that's a really a, a, an important thing because it, it, you, it, 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 it makes you want to dig and tr work a little harder. I happen to be dyslexic, as is a lot of artists. Uh, the concept of being dys dyslexic means that uh, there's certain things that I wasn't privy to as a child, and I had to find go-arounds. My go-arounds turned out to be things that actually made me a better artist, which is ironic. You know, thank God I was dyslexic. All right. One of them was is that I, um, I, I literally um, abandoned school as a child, even though I win every day, but I was the kid in the back of the room drawing and I paid no attention at all to what was going on. Literally, I landed in the eighth grade not knowing what a noun was. I, I literally didn't know what a noun was. I didn't, I didn't, had no concept of it. I didn't care. Uh, my parents were like, they just, they couldn't figure out what the hell to do with me, you know? And so, <laughs> so and very, very, very typical stuff, you know? And, and, and of course, uh, as you uh, have, a, have a reputation as being on one level, I had a, a reputation as being a good artist. On the other, I had the reputation as, of being a troublemaker. And, and the troublemaker came from hiding the fact that I felt stupid, you see. And see, that's part of that thing, too. But that in itself also is a gift because it, it gives you a sense of, of independence. I had a, very early on, I had a sense of independence that a lot of people didn't have. And my first, my first real gig as an artist, I was about 15 years old. Um, I lived uh, outside of Los Angeles. Uh, it was in the you know, early 60s. Uh, my brother was actually a drug dealer, as a lot of people were drug dealers in those days. And it was different then than it is today. You know, these are all hippies, you know, hate Ashbury and you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, you know, you watch those those old documentaries. You know, the, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And one of his big clients was a famous hairstylist in Hollywood. Uh, this guy was started off as Marilyn Monroe's makeup guy, and then he became very famous, and he was doing all these movie stars and stuff. And uh, he had a column in the Chicago to be in a syndicated column. And uh, he needed a, they needed a pencil drawing of his clients. And my brother suggested that he hire me to do these drawings. And I, I like the story also at the time, I didn't really realize, but now I can come back and look at it, that I was a 15-year-old boy in a very predominantly gay uh, in, in a cultural environment. And I, I'm thinking to myself, how did I get this job? Well, I, you know, it was pretty obvious. So they hired me, and um, that was my first, wow, I'm getting paid to be an artist. And that brought me into another another thing. You know, not only that, it was a beautiful environment. You know, I was on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. I was right across the street from Whiskey or Go Go. You know, and they, I'd go out on the sidewalk, and there'd be all these, you know, all these rock and roll folks, you know, walking down the street and stuff. And it was, you know, it was like it was it, I, it was amazing. You know, it was just really incredible. Um, the downside to it was, though, is is that I started to develop an understanding of the political part of being an artist and. I was offered things that I shouldn't have been offered. Um, uh, at that time, for instance, they did, uh, they had a program where they'd give some of the art center students in Los Angeles um, a, a shot at the uh, cover of Time Magazine. And I mean, I was, and I was offered some, uh, something along those lines and I, and I couldn't, I wasn't good enough to do that, but I was offered it anyway. And I started to realize that this is kind of a fake environment. It was a kind of a tough deal. And that being uh, being a good artist wasn't really about who you knew, um, and 
and how are you going to how are you how are you going to evolve from that? And of course, I was so young. I had at first I had a lot of ideas about what uh, the grandiose part about this. You know, I mean, I wanted to be Mozart. You know, I wanted I wanted things to really happen for me. But I realized that that path was going to be all convoluted, and people were going to tell you things that weren't true. You know, and so you learn from from that from that type of thing. But at that time, my home life was was broken. I, my parents weren't uh, getting along very good. My dad wasn't around. You know, so again, it was kind of a com combination of good news and bad news. I got married pretty young. Uh, Sue and I uh, were teenagers when we got married. Uh, started a family when we were teenagers. Uh, my father had been an entrepreneur, and he taught me through his experiences how to how to take care of myself. We started a business while we were still uh, teenagers. The business was to make money, had nothing to do with art. I literally went 20 years without doing any art at all. Um, it, you know, I like to think it was kind of like the Music Man. You know, the uh, the uh, they call it the you know they call it the Think Method. You know, where you, you think about it, you know, if you ever see Professor Hill, do you know what the music man is? There's no instruments in you. <laughs> the kids are supposed to just think about it. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that I, it was, it was very interesting in my, when I was 42 years old, um, I retired from my regular businesses. And when I picked it back up, I was a much better artist than when I left it. And I thought, you know what? It was because I never really abandoned it. I was, I've always been a very, very focused on on what I was going to be and how I was going to do it, and uh, um, uh, it was just one of those things. My family uh, was raised. My my girls were were married. They, they've been to, they were educated. Um, I was standing there. I had some money in the bank, and I thought, what you know, the day's the day I, I start pick up my art career. Wow. And, and what what age were you uh, the, when that happened? That you well, I, was 40, out? I was forty two years old. 42. Wow. Okay. I was, four, I was 42. Yeah. Yeah. And I took, I took up sculpture as a practical means of getting my feet wet. Uh, I remember at the time I didn't want to, um, uh, degrade the concept of being an artist. So I didn't want to think of myself as an artist. I'd wanted to be in, in the art world. And I literally thought of sculpture as a way to create an art product not necessarily a work of art. And I could do additions. Uh, I, you know, I could take the time I needed to pr produce a piece. And uh, literally, it was um, uh, took me uh, it took me t uh, ten more years to get back to my painting. The sculpture took off, and I and I was fulfilled me completely. And then, and then I, I was able to bring the painting in. You know, after ten years. Wow. So I'm 70 now, so it's, you know, it's, and it's still rolling like that, you know, I'm, I, I can just feel it, you know, as it comes around. It's been really, you know, you're, you're doing amazing sculpture work. And then I look at your, your folio and you've got these incredible charcoal drawings, incredible oil paintings. What would you say for you would be like, I, it seems to be all in one because you do everything exceptionally well. I, again, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't mean to just, you know, mm -hmm. butter you up here because you're sitting here in front of me. But but I, I just again, I'm looking at this, this, this folio just going, holy cow, man, like this is incredible stuff. Is there anyone now that's kind of uh, any one thing in terms of like drawing or painting or sculpture that that is taking the precedent for you? Like, do you is what's the is there a core love or is it all just intermixed for you? It, well, you know, see, the, I, I don't play an instrument, but I but I, uh, I I'm more of a my heroes are more in, in the music world, I think, mm -hmm. um, because I don't and I keep it at a distance from it so, because it's a little more magical. Um, Rock um, you know, you know, some of this stuff just just kills me. I mean, I just uh, Beethoven, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I just um, and so it, it's it, it reminds it's a little bit like um, the fact that I've, I've used the Native American culture as a subject. I'm an outsider. And so I'm using their world as a metaphor. And so when I'm thinking of art, the music is a metaphor. Um, the hook, that thing where you get chills, where you you know you you're listening to something and all of a sudden, boom, something happens and instead of falling apart, it just changes and goes in another direction and you just go, holy shit, that is good, man, that is so that feels so cool. That to me is what makes me excited. I don't think of it in visual art. 
um, in the same way. Mm -hmm. But I'm constantly trying to find it in visual art. I happen to be, uh, that's my wheelhouse. I'm visual. I can see stuff in my head. But I don't think of it as what I do. It's, that's not, being an artist is, uh, means, is, I, I like to tell people, I remind them, I think of the, 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 the Inuit have like a hundred words for snow, you know, snow is such a big part of their life. We have one word for art and it means a thousand different things, but everybody says, well, I'm an artist. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, it can mean so many different things. And for me, the fact that I happen to do it visually, um, it, so that is a roundabout way of answering your question because whether I'm sculpting or painting, I'm using the same uh, um, skill set. Uh, if I'm teaching sculpture, I'll remind people that lost and found lines, as in drawing and, and sculpture, the, the, you want things to be completely organized, and then you and then you want to surprise people. So you so you have to br you break it. You just when you think they know what they're going, you break it. You know, if you have a line that's running through something, you break it. You uh, you you leave room for them to participate. It's always about their story. You see, and that's the beauty of it. You're just the work is just there to set a stage so that they can start bringing in their own uh, feelings and understandings about their life. You know, I mean, it's not wow. has nothing to do with me. You see, and I'm just using that as a as a skill that I happen to have. My brother could play, was really a good musician. I'm not because my brother was, you see. So when we were growing up, we were opposites, you see. So those are the, so to me, that's the broad set. I mean, if I say it wrong, it sounds cavalier. You know, like, oh, you know, no big deal. I can paint, what the hell. I mean, I can sculpt, the same damn thing. But literally, when I'm thinking in terms of how I'm trying to, to bring these, these situations in, composition, of course, is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that I have a style that lends itself to detail uh, creates an interesting problem because detail is the kiss of death. K detail is very hard to deal with, but I have a tendency towards it, so I want to use it as a foil. It's the seasoning on my on my on on what I've just cooked, so to speak, and I don't want to ruin it. But 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 it's going to be there. You know, I'm going to season it with my detail, and people will look at it and they go, "Wow." It looks just like a photograph, and of course, you know that you know that 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 expression that no artist really wants to hear, but yet, it, but I'm thinking to myself, in time they will go deeper. They'll they will see what I'm trying to do here, hmm. and, and you mentioned Goya. See, Goya didn't have to go there. You see, he he was an anomaly in a sea of people that didn't they didn't have they didn't have cameras. So <laughs> so you have you know you have Vermeer. You know you have people like that. So there's it, being an artist is about being misunderstood anyway. So, you know, it's just one of those things. Uh, and the concept of marketing, you know, falls into that category, too. Of, of Why do you market something? You have to market it because you're misunderstood. You, you have to find a product and you have to find a, a person or, or a group of people that are going to decide they're going to in, store their money, you know, in, in your work as opposed to storing it in the bank or storing it in that car that they, they wanted to buy when they were a kid. Wow. Let, let's, let's just bookmark that as a subject. I do want to come back to that because yeah. that is something yeah. that fascinates yeah. me when, whenever we're yeah. talking about art and money and marketing our work. I mean, that, yeah. that is a huge subject right there, probably worthy of several hours of conversation. Um, yeah. I, 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 I want to I just circle back to, to something that you were saying earlier. Um, about using the the Native American culture as a metaphor, as something that you're exploring as an outsider, because most of you, you're pr predominantly sculpting and painting and drawing these subjects, and they're just stunning. Mm. But what, what is it that you find so attractive about these stories and situations and people? Yeah, well, uh, to begin with... Um... There's a purity, obviously, uh, when you're dealing with an, an, some type of uh, tribal. Um, to begin with, I love history. I mean, the reason I love history is I see it repeating. That sounds like a bumper sticker, of course. You know, yeah, you know, you know, you, you're, you know, you're doomed to repeat it unless you understand it. But I've always, as a kid, even with all my learning issues, um, I was a good listener, and 
I I would listen to I I love documentaries even as a child. I love listening to books, you know, uh, you know, on tape and stuff. Uh, I I'm fascinated by why people do what they do. You know, that who am I, what am I, why am I concept. I've always wondered about that. Uh, what are the differences in people? Um, generally, there is no differences in people. The differences are so nothing compared to the big picture. So it's sort of like if you go back to the Comanches, say, uh, 1830. Um, what's the difference between the, a lot of the tribal Arab cultures and the Comanches? There's not a whole lot of difference because tribal people do a certain thing to protect their environment. They have a belief in what they, uh, and, and what the land is. They have a love for things that are pure. Uh, and uh, as they grow into their community, each member of the community uh, has a role to, to, to take care of, of, of the whole. And um, their life is really about living well so they can die well. And if you if a, if you want to create a snapshot of an individual and you want to you want to say something important, I'll say like for instance I did a piece called uh, uh, an honored life, uh, and uh, it's really a, a tribute to an old guy who who's lived well and let's say who's had a family that respects him and loves him and friends that love him and stuff and he's reached that level where he has uh, he's he has all the accoutrements of his success and as a sculpture. What am I going to do? Uh, do a uh, sculpture of a businessman with a suit and tie, or am I going to create an old guy with a lot of cool character, give him a fantastic war bonnet with eagle feathers and and all kinds of neat uh, things around that that, that are, are just laden around his body and stuff? And in our in our system, in our age, we've seen movies. And even though, even if we don't know what we're looking at, we have a feeling about what it is. And you, and you say, and you say to yourself, yeah, that's about a guy who's really cool and he's really had a good life. And it's just a, it's just a picture. It's either a painting or a sculpture, you see. Um, and, and so, so the idea of calling it a metaphor is, is that you're taking something uh, that's. Uh, it's it, it, it's easier to make poetry, visual poetry, with something that people already can complete or have their own story. Uh, uh, there's a the, in Romeo and Juliet. It's a good example. Uh, uh, Romeo looks up and and here comes Juliet standing out on the balcony, and he and he he says, he says, she touches her face. To be a glove. What does he mean? Well, we know what he means because we know the story already. We all know the story. We know we know what it is when you got two teenagers who love each other who can't be together because their their families are on opposing fields. And he's what he's saying. He says, "I'd give up my life to be with her right now." Shakespeare didn't need to say that. All he had to say was to be a glove. He commented. She touches her face. You if you need to, when you create something to be a, have a, a make it a good story. You've got to. Your audience has to have an experience that, that that they bring to it. By the time, if they have no experience to it, and you have to explain it to them. You know, now you're now you're creating this book of of analytical uh, anecdotes that don't have that, that they don't have any rhythm or, or romance to it. You see. There was a lawyer that made a made a great great comment. He he was saying that uh, there was a he was talking about the importance of words, and his his analogy was is that words are not important. It's the spaces between, and he said there's a word spoken by a certain person that means a hundred different things, and the word is your name spoken by your mother. In other words, the inflection of how she says your name, you know what she means. It's a, all these different things. So the word becomes an analogy for the object. So if I'm going to paint a, 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 or sculpt a, a head of a human, it's no different than a, me sculpting a basketball, right? It's just a thing. But as soon as I put a, something that people have a little depth and it has a little inflection to it, it, no, it ceases to be just a, a piece of clay. Now all of a sudden it becomes a, a, a memory or a feeling. And... And because most people don't walk around analyzing body language all day like I do, you know, <laughs> you know, I've, I've studied it all the time. These little subtle nuances, but people know what it is when they see it. See, and and that's that's the first thing you have to do. 
You know, that's what Rachmaninoff does. That's what Beethoven did, or Mozart, or anybody like that. Herb Albert uh, bought one of my big sculptures once, and, and he, he shared with me that he had a, his, most people have to be old enough to even know who, who he is, uh, Herb Albert and, and the Tijuana Brass. But he, his big hit was the Lonely Bull, and, and he, he did the Lonely Bull without the hook. The hook was the fanfare at the beginning of it that was the da 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 Okay. And so he he went he went from a nothing song to the the biggest home run in the world. Uh, he he sold more albums than the Beatles did that year. I mean it was just <laughs> but see that that was the hook, okay? And the re, and the hook was the thing that made people familiar, that brought them in, and they and they could build on that idea. Hmm. And so this it's like someone handing you the keys to the door. This is what you do. This is how you bring it in. Hmm. You know you can you can be like Goya. You can do something really simplistic. You can. You can be like Picasso and do something that's that's this this like uh, African symbolism, or you can be uh, like uh, Sargent, who's who's the master of these juicy, tasty brush strokes, and uh, and also uh, it's just a, a portrait of somebody's wife, you know. I mean, it's like, but yet uh, you just want to die, you know, when you see it. Oh, you know, you know, yeah, so, totally. So, yeah, but see, the thing is, is that uh, it's it's more than taste. It's something that you have to, you have to, it's a, it's an acquired taste. You have to learn to get into it. Mm. I'm glad you, you, you brought that in and, and have been talking about this because this is something that I've been thinking about and struggling with for many years. And I think that my, my years uh, at fine art school and studying at a university level fine arts did a lot of damage because it caused me to go too far into my head and not really feel what I was doing. But, you know, when I look at your work and some of my other favorite artists around working today, or even people from the past like Sargent or Goyer, mm. these, these amazing painters and sculptors, there is something universal about that work. There's a moment of recognition where I feel like if you have an art background, it's almost a disservice. It, it, these are works that are universal in the way that they speak to us. And you, mm -hmm. you just have this moment of recognition. And without knowing without knowing much about Native American uh, culture, which I'm ashamed to say, you know, I'm from Texas, I've got American Indian blood in me, um, mm -hmm. you know, Comanche, Sioux and Cherokee, you know, mm -hmm. from all sorts of different mm -hmm. places, uh, mm -hmm. just a little bit more than Elizabeth yeah, Warren, sure. but just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, but, yeah. but I'm just, I, I think, um, you know, when I look at your work, I mean, without knowing those stories, there is a moment of recognition where I get exactly what, that subject is is thinking or feeling there's a there's a presence there there's a moment that you've captured and i think that's kind of what art's all about isn't it i mean it's that communication yeah. on another level entirely of course it's about it's about you know what what you're what you can build on um what you know sometimes uh, art is analytical or you're going to you're going to make a political uh, statement or you're going to make a statement that has to do with this. It's going to shock some people or whatever, and it's, or it's going to be graphic, pornographic or whatever. Uh, uh, I fit in the category of I like work that's beautiful. I like I like uh, I like like in movies. I like uh, I, I, I'll wade through a bad story to watch some really good acting. But in the end, I still like a good story. You know, I like the romantic part. I, I love that feeling you get when things are are working, you know, even though you've seen the story before, um, it, it, it's, uh, that, that's, that's the, the category that I, that I live in and, uh, uh, everything and, and the word metaphor is, is, um, you know, mythology. I call my work American mythology. It's the same thing. Um, it, you know, you were talking about, um, it being ruined by art school. Well, you know, see the, the way I see it is, is that you can separate craft from the art, all right? Uh, art school, of course, is going to teach you primarily the craft part. Your, ex your life experience is going to teach you the art, all right? Uh, it's never going to ruin you, you know. It's just going to teach you the craft. To learn to play the p piano, let's say, you know, like I've been talking about Mozart. Uh, Mozart's main thing in his life was being a composer. The piano kind of, you know, bored him, actually. He was bored with that because he was so damn good at it. He could just do it. But he still had to learn it in order to compose. 
So you have to, you have to, you know, I love the analogy, you know, I'm thinking like, um, uh, when you watch somebody that's reading music that they hadn't played before, they'll look at it and they'll read it and they'll play it and they look at it and you can, and there's, it kind of moves a little bit. So it comes from your head down to your, to the music. When somebody's internalized something, it comes, you can feel it comes from here. It just yeah. comes out. Okay. Mm-hmm. You have, and that's another one of those bumper stickers, you know, you have to know it so well, you can forget about it. All right. Wow. That's what art is. You, you have to be able to just forget about it mm-hmm. and it just comes through. You have a vehicle. Um, now, I mean, at, the, at my point where I'm at, my work sometimes gets so technical I am, and I get so in the weeds with it a lot of times that I don't know, I'll, 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 I'll forget about it too much, <laughs> and then I have to spend a couple of days fixing what I had forgotten about. <laughs> but, but still, it's it's that there's a feeling when it is when it's not it it's not flowing, it's not fitting. Uh, that's where the music comes in. You see, music is lineal, so you know, I mean, it starts here and it ends here, and and uh, there's a place in the middle, you know, where you got that little thing that happens. Art, there's a lot of places that where it can where it can be messed up. The other thing is, is there's a consciousness that, that, that breaks. I have about, I usually f- figure, and this is one of the reasons that I teach. I don't teach that often, but when I do teach, I'm really doing it for me. And one of them is, is to test the, the, my ideas on my students. And one of the things we talk about is how long can you look at something before you can't see it anymore? And for me, it's about three or four minutes. Um, you know, that's the old thing where you're doing a, uh, maybe you're, you're painting a, a, a portrait of somebody. And if you're, if you let it go longer than the four or five minutes, the eyes start to go like this. They start to go out of skew and, and you can't see it. So what do you do? You look in your mirror behind you or you turn the painting upside down and then you see it again. Or you walk away and you come back. All right. So the, that part of it has to do with the language, you know, your, your pronunciation, you're trying to say it just right. You're trying to put the, put the, the, the notes in the right order. You know, um, uh, by proof of uh, what a sour note is. Yeah, I love that analogy, too. You're in a theater. The guy's up there playing his composition that he just wrote the night before. What does he do? He hits the wrong key. You can hear the seat squeak in the theater. And you have to ask yourself, how come everybody knew that he hit the wrong key? You know, they never heard it before. You see, they, they knew because he brought you into a certain lineage or, you know, and it, something came and it was out of Congress. So. Order is the key to good art, but ironically, the disorder is the thing that gives you the, the chills. So you break it and you fix it in a way to where you, people are surprised and they go, whoa, yeah, isn't, isn't that amazing? See, that's what Sargent did. Sargent's work is so well ordered. And then you go, wait a minute, that woman is eight foot tall. You know, I mean, how did that happen? You know, how come I didn't notice that before? Or, 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 or the finger, you know, was just painted with a little, you know, like this. And yet, when you go back, it's just exactly the way it's supposed to be. There's there's an elegance to things like that, that as humans, we really admire and we trust. And then once you trust it, you want more of it. And that's that's the part of mastery. That's the part of how you refine what you're doing. You know, the better you get, the less you do. The, the Your subject starts to get simplified. Mm-hmm. You, your, your work gets a little... But yet your audience, it doesn't come along with you. They have to, they have to work just as hard sometimes to come along with you. Mm. You see, it's, I, I, I've just been absolutely enamored with Sargent's work for so many years. And I remember the first time I saw an original because right? I'd never mm-hmm. seen an original like growing up and in, all I oh, had yeah. was like little images and books. Yeah. And I, I, I remember this painting you know from from a reproduction and then now i'm standing in front of the real thing and it was one of his venetian interiors and oh, yeah. um there was a there was a guy just kind of like on on a table uh, at his elbow there he's resting his head yeah. in his hand like this and he was kind yeah. of looking out yeah. the window and i looked at the um the the face of this gentleman and it just it broke my heart because i realized just in that moment that all sergeant had done 
was three or four little squiggles with a brush. And yeah, I yeah. knew this guy. I knew yeah. him. I knew what he was yeah. thinking. And yeah. I knew that yeah. he was like, oh, why did I marry her? You know, there was something, <laughs> there was something about his yeah. character in that moment, you know? And I was like, yeah. whoa. And I, I knew at that moment, like that, that, that was, there was a level of mastery there. And, and I, I, I love what you were saying as well. Like there's this kind of this point where, where the process also becomes intuitive in a way like you you reach that level and now yeah. suddenly you're just you're dialed in something just clicks and i've been i've been very fortunate in my career i've I, i've experienced a couple of those click moments um one of them for me was you know the the and, and i'm not saying i'm at the level you are a sergeant or anybody like that but for myself like what i what i experienced was Painting was such a a, a, a a task that it required all of my mental faculties. Like it, it required everything. I had to think about everything I was doing. And I remember this day really clearly where my mind started to wander mm -hmm. as I was painting. And then suddenly I realized, hang on a second, I am not thinking about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then I suddenly realized, oh, wait my hand is just taking over now. And <laughs> yeah, it became yeah. intuitive. And then it was at that yeah. moment that I could start listening to music. I started listening to, to audio books. I started yeah, occupying yeah. my conscious mind now with things yeah, yeah, while yeah, I was good, doing that's that. That's interesting. Yeah. You yeah, know, it was yeah, so strange, yeah. but I, I wonder, yeah. I wonder if that was kind of like, like the, you know, the person sitting in front of that piano and suddenly they've internalized the music and now they're just hitting the keys. And well, it's like, yeah, it's I, I'm happening. sure it is. I, I, mm. I know it is. Uh, uh, that's the thing. Uh, you know, you have to keep uh, keeping order sometimes. I mean, you never the word of the, the idea of mastering something. Uh, every project I do, um, I'm up in the ante a little bit. All right, I am, I'm always trying to, which means that I'm not I'm not in, I don't have it internally. I have to fake it. All right, I remember the very first piece I did. Um, I was in, in so far over my head on it. And somehow or other, after it was finished, it was passed off as something that was good. Uh, now I look back on it now, I'm proud of it for in, in the fact that it was what it was something I did at the time. Of course, I could do way better today. You know, I mean, I've grown quite a bit, but I still feel like I'm faking it, you see. And I think it's important. To, to take to acknowledge that because growth being teachable you know and being humble um, you know and now and that being said see I'm not one of these guys that believes that the great masters came before I don't believe that see sergeant didn't have the internet I think he would have been better had he had the internet all right he had it, it was hard it was a lot harder for him um, the reason we look back, at, you know, at people like him, and we're so we're we're so amazed, is that they set a, a template that we a, a place for us to stand on. You know, it's that old analogy. You know, it's the shoulders of giants. It's 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 just the way it is. It's like, and we don't know as an artist, you don't know a time where there wasn't sergeant. He became the standard of everything, and so unfortunately, or fortunately, the more sergeant esque you get the more happy you are with what you're doing. But the reality, what you're doing is, is you're, you're moving off your center a little bit. And that's what we do. But see, it goes back to craft. And I brought that up earlier. I came into art because I'm a natural craftsman. As a child, I was a good craftsman. In other words, I, I, it wasn't that I could draw, I could copy stuff, okay? And I, even when I was a kid, I knew that wasn't art. You know, I, I, someone else did the art. I'm just copying the damn thing. I knew that, you know, and then as I got a little older, you know, I started to, to really get interested in design and stuff like that. When I was working for George Masters, uh, I was copying photographs. I was just, they just needed one of pencil drawings of photographs. Uh, I was working for a famous man and I was, and I was a kid in an environment that uh, made me seem like I was really special, but it, it, there was nothing really special about it because I, and when I was asked to do something that was important, I, I knew I couldn't do it, you see? So you learn that, okay, so does that mean that you can't be a good artist? I just know that the one brings you to the, to, to the idea of another. Uh, 
uh, I could have been a musician. I, maybe I could have been a poet. To me, they satisfy that same itch in me. But I, I had developed uh, the, the strength inside me for understanding visual uh, language. And the vocabulary that I could think in was, was imagery. Uh, I'd get excited about how, how light and dark play against each other and how, you know, hard and soft edges and, and looking at photography and stuff. Uh, that to me, and it would just be, would, and I would be moved by it. Uh, Fritz, Fritz Lang, you know, watching me, that movie The Metropolis, you know, and you, you look at that and you go, God, you know, it's just like, where did that guy come from? So you see where these people come and then, and then they've influenced all these generations. Um, yeah, there are heroes, but the, but the real artists are, are living today. The people today, we have more going on today. Uh, we have to. I mean, we're, we're evolving. It, it, and it's just a language. The problem is, is that the audience it, it has a little, it, maybe, it takes a, maybe it takes a lifetime to understand it and a lifetime to see it. I, 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 I'm with you on that. I, I think um, some of the best artists ever could be alive today, working today. I do think we have the tendency to look back in the past and, and put these these greats and the masters up on pedestals. Maybe maybe rightfully so. I mean, I, I have the utmost oh, oh, respect yeah. of people who are able to do stuff without resources that we have today. Now I look at the resources that we have, like, let's say, you know, photographic reference, digital technology, being able yeah. to do things to just forward our our creativity. Like I, I think if Caravaggio was alive today, I mean, he was using a camera obscura, but if he could have used a digital projector, maybe he would be. <laughs> maybe he'd be like, what, you guys are, you've got this technology? Well, what, yeah, well, why well, not? Well, yeah, you see, you see, and you can make the argument, what the difference does it make? You know, because it's uh, Ansel Adams, you know? Uh, yeah. Uh, Ansel Adams was brilliant because of his compositions. Yeah, and absolutely. His, his, and his love to get get it right. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, I'll make the argument that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was probably the most influential and best artist of the last century. Uh, and people go, "What?" And I go, "Well, he inf look at look at what he what he did. You know, whether you like his architecture or not. That's amazing. Look what he did yeah. to, to influence. But yeah. uh, but did he own a hammer? Okay." And yeah, the point yeah. to that that question is, is he 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 wasn't even building this stuff. He was someone else was building it. You see, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a thing. I happen to be a craftsperson, but I I put I value the design part. You see, mm -hmm. I want to be known as a designer. I just haven't gotten uh, the uh, the in to that place where I can have other people make my stuff for me. <laughs> you know, but but I don't put it. I I look at it all as you know in the same place. Um, you know, it, it's and, and don't get me wrong either. When I talk about uh, you know guys like Sargent, there's a handful of guys from that period. Hmm. I can't say that I've ever seen anybody's work better that I like better today than anything that Sargent did. There's sure. a couple of this piece, of course. It's just that I don't like the idea of using it as a crutch. It's it's easier to say, yeah, those guys were the masters. We'll never be that good. It's like I have artist friends that talk like that, and I don't like to hear that. I like it. I say that's bullshit. We're going to get. We're, we're, we we have we have the resources to go beyond that. But as you were talking about art school and stuff, sometimes our influences do get in our way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, you know, we're uh, going to be talking about marketing at some point, and you you yeah, your yeah, whole yeah. your whole audience your audience out there has an expectation, mm -hmm. and that expectation will, on one level, creates a responsibility in you that makes you want to work harder. But on the other end, you want to also give them what they what they think they're going to pay for. You see, because they're they're not going to bed dreaming about art like you are. They're they're, they're they have other lives, and you know I, I've got some collector friends who are really good collectors who definitely don't know much about art, <laughs> but, but, but they love collecting. You well, I, I can tell you one thing. Everybody that's listening to this podcast is dreaming about art. <laughs> this is, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. very much yeah, so. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's, I think, I, I just, yeah, just to kind of clarify though, my, my 
my thoughts there because again, I've been thinking about this for years, and and like you, I I, I do have an issue when people do put these people up on pedestals. Yeah, it's it's important to give respect where respect is due, but I think what it does is it also limits us in that moment. I mean, when we look back at these artists of the past, they were just human beings. They were just right. people dealing with those circumstances at that time. There was nothing in the water then that created these superhumans. They were just human right. beings that were sensitive, that were responding to their environment. We certainly yeah. have the capability to do that now, I, I yeah. think. And and so I think, yeah. and, and I also think that now more than ever, especially now, I heard this all the time at the art school that I went to, which was a very contemporary art school. They were pushing the modern art movement, which I think is just mm -hmm. not something that should be pushed. I think it's a psyop, a massive conspiracy, and I, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But yeah, I, I yeah, think I yeah. think modern art, for the most part, is complete garbage. But I think that that what what happened is it it kind of gave way to this idea that painting is dead, tradition is dead, realism is dead. But now I think that there's more of a demand and a hunger than ever for things that are traditional, things that are realistic, and things that are made by hand from skilled craftsmen, you know, right. from people that really know their craft, that really know their stuff. I think, exactly. I think people are hungry yeah. for it, right? Well, well of course. Uh, the, the, the more we go away from it, the more valuable it becomes. Yeah. You see? Of course. Um, it's, it's ludicrous if you think in terms of... Uh, uh, the styles of art today, literature, okay? Um, uh, Harry Potter, all right? It's a child's book, basically. But, but um, the skill it took to write those, those books, and I have, I, 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 as it turns out, I, I haven't read any of them, but, but I understand the story, and, I, and, I, and I'm thinking, and I'll put, I'll, put them in this, in the, I'll put them in the category of art because it, it has to be. It's, a person had to create that from experiences that relate to other people's experiences, which is essentially what I'm trying to accomplish. All right. And they have to be interesting at the same time. So you're taking a kind of a trite story on one level that maybe has been told so many times and you twist it and turn it into something else. Uh, when I was a kid and one of my, still one of my favorite stories is Alice in Wonderland. You know, it's a pretty basic stuff, but it puts you in another state. You know, it puts you, it takes you out of one world, puts you in another world. Uh, there's never going to be an end to that kind of feeling. For someone to comment that, you know, realism or, or board, uh, art with, with that doesn't have a narrative, you know, or, you know is, it, is, is better than narrative art. It, it, it's like, well, why, 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 why even bother watching a movie? Um, movies are more arty today than they, than they used to be. I mean, you know, back in the 50s, some of the, uh, the movies that were coming out were just churned out for the, just for the you know, they, they were formulated. You have directors now and stuff who are truly artists. You have cinematographers that are true artists. And, and, and it's like art, visual art is stronger and more prevalent today than it's ever been. You know, it's everywhere. That's, you know, so for anybody to make a comment, you know, that it's that kind of stuff isn't happening. It's like that's that's. But. But what you're talking about is also another thing too is is that you're that, that there are certain things that create a a political statement in a sense um, and it's easier to make a statement if it isn't obvious what it is you know so you have that that kind of a of a thing going on you know uh, mark rothgau would be an example i and i happen to really like mark R rothgau actually um, me too to be honest yeah, yeah, yeah me too sure sure yeah. sure um uh uh, Steve Wynn from the, you know, the, the casino, Wynn Casino, so, uh, uh, had bought a, a, a Rothko for his birthday, and his, his friend was Tony Robbins, and he asked Tony Robbins to come over. He says, I want to show you what I bought myself for my birthday. And he, he's, he walks in, and he looks at it, and he goes, so he says, what do you think? And he says, by the way, he said, I paid $25 million for that. And so, so Tony says, uh, if you got some brown paint, I'll, I'll paint you another one. You know? So, <laughs> <laughs> but... But 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 he but he in the story he wasn't he literally he wasn't saying he wasn't saying that was a bad idea that this wasn't important that wasn't the point the the point was the point was is that certain things um, have certain levels of of value that are based more on a society uh, in a in a in a they're they're kind of cataloged 
um, by a culture. Mm -hmm. And Rothgau was one of those people that had been put into that category. Uh, and it, it's, it's, his work is like currency in some way. It's validated by the fact that it's been exchanged on, on certain levels. And the value of it becomes uh, layered on, in, different, in, in different ways. Uh, and I happen to think it is beautiful. Is, and whenever I drop the, the idea in my mind that, it, that, that maybe it's not there to just pull, you know, pull, pull a trick on you, you know, like, you know, it's like the emperor's new clothes kind of a thing. Mm. So you have a lot of that going on and in, in, in back and forth. But see, it's, it's in my mind, though, Roth, using Rothko as an example, uh, we're not in the, I'm not in the same business that he's in, you see, or, or that he's in. He has nothing to do with what I'm doing necessarily. Other than he's com composing uh, simple shapes and simple subtle colors, and he he came at a time when this type of work became uh, there was an uh, there was an opportunity for it to become very valuable and become iconic re very quickly, and create some sort of elite kind of almost political uh, thing where if you w needed to have it and make a statement, you know you. You buy the, you know, the, the, today it's like Jeff Koons. You know, Jeff Koons creates that same thing, whether you like his work or you don't like his work. If you, if he you drives me a, nuts. He well, drives yeah, yeah, me so, mental. So, 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 you buy a, so, so you buy a big bronze uh, uh, blow-up uh, uh, dog. And, but, you know, but you said yeah. at the same time, it's back to that thing. We, were yeah. we started off talking about the coronavirus. It's, 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 it's part of that organic texture. Mm -hmm. of the life as you pass through it. Mm -hmm. And it's great that it drives you nuts on one level, but on the other level, you know, it's part of, it's just, it's the part of the minutia that you have to, yeah. you have to maneuver and you can use it. You can, that's my point. You don't have to get out of its way. You can actually use it for where, where you're at and you can em embrace it. You know, I, 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 I see. Yeah. On, on a certain level, I think, yeah, you're, you're right. It's absolutely necessary, isn't it? I mean, look, if we didn't yeah. have that, how would we be able to have something to judge against? I mean, for well, me, course. for me, I, there, that, it puts everything in a certain context. You've got things that yeah, are meaningless yeah. and then that creates, therefore, therefore, by virtue, you've got something that sure. has meaning, you know, how, I, how, how could you be a Republican if there was no such thing as a Democrat? You see? There you go. You, you got to have it. So quit, quit complaining. You know, you yeah. know, you know, it's like, thank God for these characters that are on the other side of the fence. Yeah. It, it's, it's all part of that whole point. Yeah. Um, I'm only a good artist because some people see me as being better in their opinion than, pe than my contemporary, some of my contemporaries. Yeah. But if we were all as good as me, well, that would mean that I wouldn't be any good. Right. It's all, everything is always compared to something else. Sure. It sounds so so basic, doesn't it? But we don't really but, think about it in those terms. It's, no, it's important no, to kind don't. of acknowledge. It, yeah, it, it is. You acknowledge it because you need to save yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, it's and it's uh, it's OK to get pissed off about stuff. I'm, don't sure. get me wrong. You know, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of different angles. I while about uh, five years ago, I had the opportunity to take a workshop from Odd Nerdrum. Are you familiar uh, with Odd Nerdrum? Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was, a, it was a really a neat opportunity. It might know it was longer than five years, I guess, but he was teaching in New York. But there was, there's things that he does that absolutely I couldn't even tell my, my friends about because, because they, they would just be appalled. But then on the other end, what he was doing was so crazy cool on some other level, yeah. you see? And I looked at it, I looked at the, at the taking a workshop from a guy like that that was so far out of, of this world as an opportunity to experience something. And the only way you can do that, though, is you have to embrace it for that moment. I was talking to a few other people in the class, and I was thinking, wow, this guy is like, how, how do you feel about it? And, and I mean, I could go on about how peculiar some of the things he was doing were, but they said, you know, we would be disappointed if he wasn't like that. You know, because literally it was like going into another time frame. And he's in a role in how he presents himself and presents his work that doesn't break. I mean, it's, it's a total lineage. And uh, to me, it, it falls into that category of thank God. Isn't it great to be alive when you have certain people like that? Whether you like it or not, the fact that they, they, they're, they're doing what they're doing and they have a following 
Mm-hmm. And you watch that following. Now, when I watch it, I get I roll my eyes sometimes because it's kind of ridiculous. But on other times, uh, what it's done is is it bends stuff and it allows you to 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 explore more of what what you're you're up to. I, I've for the people that are listening to this that aren't as familiar with Odd Nerdrum's work, a, a quick Google search would reveal you know some of his his paintings. And I remember I had a, a flatmate many years ago who had a giant book like a telephone book thick when the when the yeah. telephone used to be a thick book uh yeah. telephone book thick portfolio of just full of art odd nerdrum paintings over the decades yeah. it's some yeah. of them were the most confronting horrifying yeah. uh disturbing <laughs> yeah, images like how could you paint something like let's say a woman uh crouched on the the bank of a creek defecating like how could you paint well, well, no, something that, like that, that's, this that's that's a signature painting. You and, know? and that's, I mean, just, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. And that's one and, of the lighter ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, but see, the key is, the key is, is to take that and then, and then, and then look past it. Yes. And, but, and, and I, and the way I would look at it would be is, is that uh, I literally had a feeling uh, when I took his workshop that I was getting uh, sort of a, uh, a, a, a pass in front of the line that my some of my comrades who would have been appalled by that wouldn't take. In other words, it's a place in life. Sometimes you just have to have to move past some of those things and understand that there's another it, 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 that bump in the road is actually going to reveal itself. I, and he, he's got yeah. a. A lot of interesting philosophy that goes along with this painting as well. I, look, I, I'm sure so. I, I think part of it, I, and I don't know, I'm not inside his mind. And I, to be honest, at the time it, there was this initial shock factor of looking at a lot yeah. of his works. But then I started looking at it and going, hang on, there's something here. It's more than just something that is like, uh, you know, right. yeah, th- there's there's more than th- that. Like maybe there's something here. Maybe it's about, hey, could we take something like this and make it, you yeah. know, intriguing, interesting, yeah. or or point yeah. to something yeah. that is a common element. Hey, we all do yeah. that, you know? Well, like, yeah, you see, you see, and just by me, virtue of me actually saying that, especially mm. on your podcast here, yeah. reveal something about me, maybe, mm-hmm. you see, and then other people go, what, you know? Yeah. Um, when I'm working on some of my work, whether it's a sculpture or a painting or whatever, I will purposely sometimes make a mistake. Oh, I'll wow. purposely throw something in that's wrong. And what it does is, is it creates, it creates an environment to where I have to deal with that, with that anomaly. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes when you open your mind to certain uh, other artists, it does, it does the same, it does the same thing. There has to be a, a there, there's a, it's a gift to be to live a certain amount of time. There's a gift to be alive at a certain time too. Uh, it, it, for me to say that the coronavirus actually has value. It, most people would misunderstand me if if I just said it like that. You have to use all the caveats that, that and and all the res, due respect, of course. But it's 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 like the Holocaust. I mean, people that have studied the Holocaust. I mean, you really study something like that. You really understand it. Uh, that there's that people actually survived during the on both sides of the fence i mean there were guards and there were people that there were prisoners who are human beings who were the same in so many ways as you and i and by understanding those things you 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 it gives you a, 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 i think a greater opportunity it isn't like you can hold those feelings but it gives you a greater opportunity and so when you embrace something you know uh that you don't understand, and and you're right. Jeff Koons drives me nuts too, but it but sometimes in a good way because because it, because it is so is so beyond. Wait a minute, that isn't what you're supposed to be able to do. And and I'll tell you how I live with it is I use the word business. You see, I'm not in that business. This guy's in this business. I'm in this business. You see, and there's different ways that you can bring yourself to it. And to me, it sort of levels the field, keeps your path open, and. It, it means that when you're on your deathbed, you if you still have a lucid moment, you can say to yourself, you know what, I, I really I was I was awake during the ride, you know, I actually did stay awake. I happen to be a, a recovering alcoholic, and that's the other reason why I say that, because staying awake is not something that I spent a lot of my life not being awake. Yeah, you know, I, I haven't had a drink since 
since I was 35 years old. And that, so that was almost 30, that was 35 years ago. Um, but it was another one of those things that gives me a benchmark. It's like a rebirth. It's, a, it's like you get to start over again. And what happens when somebody is working on a process of drinking themselves to death, and then they, they, then they quit and they choose to live, they've actually chosen to, be, to survive on a level that, that, that gives them permission to be a little more aware, to be a little bit more open, to be able to see things a little bit more. Um, the fact that I'm, you know, we talked about before, I'm, I have the classic dyslexia, you know, that a lot of artists have. Again, it gives me an opportunity. The fact that I, the reason I don't read, that I haven't read certain books is because I, when was the last time I read a book? I, I don't, I can't remember the last time I read a book. I mean, I literally have tr really a lot of trouble reading. But I really can, but I can remember things, you know, and I, so there's a lot of other opportunities too. So th the whole point is, is that the moral of the story is, is the things that hold you back are ironically the things that are actually going to move you forward. There was, those are the, you know, the, the idea of making a mistake. Um, thank God you made the mistake because if you didn't make the mistake, how are you going to learn? You don't learn from your successes. You literally don't learn from what you already knew how to do. You already knew how to do that. So you set the stage so that you can create stumbling blocks and you can create controversy and you can, you can explore things and you can test yourself. You know, uh, you know. I, I think this is why, you know, when, when we... When we indulge in things, I'm glad you brought that in again. I mean, when we indulge in things like watching the news that promote one particular side of an argument or one right, particular right. narrative, or you're watching it something something that is particularly polarizing in terms of politics, you turn on that TV station, they're promoting that person, this other TV station promotes that person, and you're not going to get any of that opposing point of view. I think... I think whenever you do that, you're filtered into seeing things from one side. And, and I like that you brought this into the conversation because I think about this all the time. I think there's a silver lining in everything. There's a benefit to everything, everything we can use in some way. The minute we decide and label it as, no, no, this is a that we don't entertain the idea that it could be something else. And yeah. this is the other thing as well. I get emailed all the time from people who want to know how to be a successful artist, mm -hmm. yet they're so dang afraid of failing. And that's, that's the yeah. thing that I, that I, I'm constantly on about. It's like, no, you got to fail, go out there and fail spectacularly and do well, a great well, job yeah. at that. Cause you're going to yeah, learn there, something. You're going to be, something's going to come out of it. Uh, there's, there's one simple secret to success mm -hmm. and that is to embrace failure. And that's as strange as that sounds, that's the key to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that I, I quit my career at 19 years old, got married, had kids, started at 42. Part of it was is that I wanted that I was, I was insecure enough with the art, of course, and loved it so much, that I was af totally afraid of it. Wow. But but, I had to get the money part out of the way, mm -hmm. and. Once I started my career, I was, was actually conflicted, of course, that I, what if I would have started when I was, what if I was kept going? And I realized I would have made a lot of stupid mistakes, that not, not, not good mistakes, the kind of mistakes that might have maybe uh, kept, held me back, maybe. It was maybe better that I went the path I did, but the, w once I started my career, I sat out on my front porch and I started to write my little diagram of what I needed to do and how I was going to measure my success. And the top of my list was all the things that I was afraid of and that I was going to commit myself to do, speaking in public. Wow. Um, yeah. I, I had a much bigger fear of that than I think most people do, even though most people would argue with that. They say, you know, most people would rather die than speak in public. but. I realized that that was holding me back. Yeah, I see, you know, if you're an artist, you have to talk about your work. Um, uh, and I started making commitments on, on what I was going to do. I was going to start applying for things that I normally wouldn't do. I was going to use rejection as a, as a way of, of measuring my success. Someone asked me a couple of years later, how are you doing? I said, I'm in a lot of pain, so I must be doing very well. 
You know, oh, what do you wow. mean by that? Well, well, I'm, I'm getting rejection uh, notices. Uh, those rejection notices let me know that I'm on the path. You see, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you turn it around, you know, people got to believe that they got to See, that's the key. Uh, people don't want to believe that they want, how, how do you do this? Well, no, you, you, you have to be it. You, you really have to be an asshole. You really have to put yourself in a situation where people are going to go, Jesus, what the, like walking into a gallery, schlepping your stuff in and say, gee, well, you here, I, I want to be in your gallery. That's, that's a, you know, it's like, get out of here. You know, it's like, you know, they, they do whatever they can. You know, oh my God, you know, I mean, you don't want to buy something. You want to sell me something. Gallery owners are like, oh my God, this is the most awful thing in the world. Yeah, I've done that's that. That's the reason why. <laughs> well, of course you have. Every artist has. Any, every artist that's successful has, yeah. you know. And it's, you're, intru you're an intruder. You know, you, no one wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. until you can do it in a way to where you give you you're proud of yourself for the failure, you literally got to be proud of yourself. Yeah. 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 I'm moving forward here. Mm -hmm. now, when I used to use the word asshole, I meant it's like you feel that way because you would have never you want to protect your dignity. And then you finally get to the point where, no, that's not that's not what it is. It's your dignity is 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 much bigger than that. Your dignity is is to be an advocate for it for for your career, not for your stupid ego. The ego is important. Yeah, I think, see, that's the irony is, the ego isn't like an engine that drives you, but you have to have, you have to be an advocate for the art and the process, the mastery, the idea of moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the goal is, is to grow, is to grow and, and to move, move forward. How do you do that? You find, you find ways to measure your success by creating situations that, that you, hit you in the head and they and they, they beat on you a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you have to feel that loss. You have to, oh, yeah. Uh, my dyslexia, the com we're on this computer here, you know, yes. and, and and we've got this this technology mm -hmm. and, you know, Sergeant and all that kind of stuff. He didn't have a computer. What do I have that Sergeant didn't have? A, I have a computer. Now, I'm old enough, too, to where my son-in-laws and stuff will say, wow, you're really great that you've got, you bought an iPhone and all that. You know, this was 20 years ago, you know. It's like, well, well I, hey, I'm really into technology. Well, I'm also got a learning disability. And you don't think this stuff doesn't screw with my learning disability. I mean, I get on this stuff. It's like this Skype stuff. It's like, what a wonderful thing. Part of the reason I wanted to do this with you is that I know that this is going to be helpful for, for me going forward. But it drives me nuts because it, it, it's something that's hard for me to grasp. And, and when I, all I have to do is have a few little things go wrong and that whole feeling that goes, I, all of a sudden the depression starts to come in that thing where I'm losing my mind, you know, cause I, you know, I'm oh. not quite, quite there. I, I, yeah. You know, I know exactly and, what that's like, yeah. especially well, with well, technology for me, like me and technology, well, sure. we don't mix, but well, I, but I manage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you work with your hands, you see? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a I'm a good craftsman, but see, technology doesn't involve craftsmanship. So what it what it amounts to is that I've learned how to move through that. Yeah, sure. You know, and that, and that's that's the key to everything. You know, when you t teach a workshop, um, very rarely when I was teaching, uh, would I f feel like I was really teaching them how to sculpt or or some of the principles in art. What I wanted to teach them is how to how to how to survive in an environment where they have to, you know, show their underbelly, show, show that they're not who they thought they were. And, and that, and that it, it's okay to fail because you're going to fail in front of everybody, especially mm -hmm. as, as the instructor, you know, I mean, I'm demonstrating and here, you know, it's like, you know, and it's like, you're here, you are. And it's like, uh, you know, you know, some of the students would say, uh, well, is it like your technique that you make the legs too small or something, you know? And I go, no, it's not my technique. It's just that I, you know, I, I, I just screwed up. That's all. You can, know, it's can, just, I, it's... can I bring something into the podcast? <laughs> I, Cause I can totally relate. I was teaching yeah. a landscape painting workshop many years ago. I won't mention her name, uh, but I was, this is when I was teaching live workshops and yeah. I was trying to teach optical color mixing, painting a sunset. So I was, uh -huh. I was, you know, getting in touch with my internal Edgar Payne 
And yeah. uh, I was yeah. I was showing this technique how we use different different colors to make uh, something you know a, a uniform transition between uh, you know these beautiful reds and yellows and oranges into the blue without actually having it go green. And I remember I was painting, I was getting real nervous because the room just re went really quiet. And then in the background, I just heard this. This woman reminded me of, you know, Selma and Patty out of The Simpsons. She's like one uh -huh. of those. And she just chain smoking as well. And she was just like, I don't like it. You know, <laughs> that's all I heard. And everybody else just like, you could have heard a pin drop. And I turned around. Yeah, I'm uh -huh. like, well, I'm not effing done yet. Like, just give it a minute. But dude, like, no, yeah. no, that's perfect. I, oh, I know. And, that, and that, that's and again, that's why that's what I got out of the experience of myself. I was doing it for myself. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and by able to turn that around and let my students know that mm. I'm the one getting all the lessons here. You're going to get a few, but I'm the one getting the most of them. I that true. And, and yeah. I and I could I could spout off on all of my little things and my little bumper sticker philosophy. Mm -hmm. Tell me where I'm going wrong, and people would come up with these ideas. And sometimes they uh, they would show me, and I go, Yeah, yeah. You know what? I hadn't thought of that. Mm. But it puts. But that's the key to it. You know, it's the it's the key of being able to put yourself in what constitutes an expert. It puts you in that, uh, that environment where you, you're, you're, you're up high enough where people intuitively want to cut your legs off. They want to be able to do that. And, it, and it's very helpful because it gives you the opportunity you know, to, find, to really find out what's important and what's real and what works and what's, you know, what's not, not real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what one of the most valuable places, though, uh, for, for this type of thing, um, for an artist these days, uh, I'll just speak from experience, the YouTube comment section, just go wading oh. through that. And that's, <laughs> that's an education well, see, right there. I don't know if I'm there. strong enough. I don't know if I'm strong enough. No. <laughs> oh, gee. I, you know, I, I, yeah, that, I, oh, I could imagine. Well, oh. sure, because now, you, now you're dealing with people that are anonymous. I don't know about that stuff. Uh, they're going to tell you exactly what they think, man. <laughs> well, well, yeah, it is funny because, I mean, it's uh, obviously Instagram and, and Facebook. One of the, the negatives I found was is that inherently people do like to compliment you. They're never going to say, you know, hey, you know what? I think you suck. But I think on YouTube, <laughs> on YouTube, I think there's another there's another dimension there. And I've I've kind of picked up on that, that, yeah. that they don't that, that's that, it's a little harder. Oh, know, there's to, one there's one that just kills me. It still gets me. But there were, I just posted my how to paint portraits, you know, tutorial. There was a short YouTube video. And this one comment was like, oh, gee, well, I feel a lot better about my paintings now. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> thanks yeah thanks a bunch yeah, i know yeah. exactly what you mean <laughs> <laughs> but hey yeah. look a lot of people like that and it helped a lot of people so i'll stick with it you know um but look hey well, see, see again you were the one that got the benefit though you see oh sure you got the benefit yeah. Oh, you yeah. got you got to stay human, and you got to stay. And I, I I've seen this with so many artists, right? And so many uh, of who we call masters. And you know who the masters are because they're the ones that are going to tell you, "I'm a master." Yeah. And artists like that. There, there's <laughs> just there's. I also you need that balancing factor of somebody who's willing to come up and say, "Hey, you know what? You kind of suck," or "You know what? I like this, but you missed something here." And because I think we got to yeah. remember that. We're all yeah, learning. Yeah, We're, yeah, the minute you yeah. decided you've mastered this thing, the minute you decided you got this thing whipped, I think you're done as an artist. And I think well, you're well, done as a person. You, you are. I think the best way to describe it, though, is, is to get back to the marketing concept, you see, because yeah. in marketing, you have to you have to describe what your product is. What is it you're selling? Mm. All right. So you, if you take, you know, remember, you know, like Thomas Kincaid, speaking of the master of light, yeah. taking a, a particular thing and you're putting a hook on it. This yeah. is the hook. Um, and, and then people would say things that were derogatory, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's sort of a, uh, and I would, I would say, and I would defend, you know, I, I, would be, I would be quick to defend Thomas Kincaid as an artist because I didn't look at him as, an, as a fine artist. I looked at him as a man who had created a system to create uh, a, a, an attractive uh, art product that people... Um, could that, that the people uh, could feel um, like a quick a little story that and and then and, and they were cute and they were simple and uh, accessible yeah ac yeah accessible and yeah. Uh, where the, where they deep no he wasn't selling deep okay no. he, he uh, so the, the what I was trying to do is is 
redefine the fact that we're not talking about it's unfair to talk about somebody in the wrong category you see mm-hmm. um, if a person is interested in being a poet uh, they don't they don't automatically take a one word to, to to explain who they are and what they are like being the master of light uh, that's not very poetic it means he's one-dimensional it's like odd Nerdrum being the master of defecating women you know <laughs> it, it's it, it, there's it's not about that it, yeah. you see the depth is about something else and see when you're talking about marketing though you see that's the other issue well, because now you're trying to put yeah. a now you're trying to put a, a, a put it into some kind of a category yeah I've I've even told people uh, when the you know they're in certain environments if they ask me what it is that I sell or what I do I said I'm in the collectible business mm-hmm. because I, my work is not meant to decorate with but I know that people do decorate with it and I, it's important for me that it looks de- decorative. I want it to be. I want it to be pleasing. I want people to be able to live with it. Yeah. You know. So I'm not in the same business with Odd Nerdrum as an example. Um, but you see, that's the key, though. The key is, is that you have to understand that you're. The, 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 if you're saying that people are collecting, it means that it's evolving and it's based on something that that is that has been given some sort of a dimension by other people that are sup- supposedly the experts, and they know. The experts are people that run shows, people that have galleries, mm-hmm. you know, people that give awards, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, other collectors. And what happens is it builds a culture. Mm-hmm. And within yeah, that sure. culture, culture, you're brought into it as a person who does a certain thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, in a very simplistic way, you know, I'm the guy that 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 does Indians, you know, and of course I don't like that, but yet I I'll let people say whatever they need to say. I see, but again, it's it's having the, that 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 uh, juxtaposition of ideas, though. Yeah. And under, understanding that marketing or li- making a living, mm. uh, it, it it does have to do with the quality of your work, but it isn't about the it isn't necessarily about the quality of the work. It's about the position that the artist takes to present themselves to fit a certain collector base. Sure. Uh, and whether, if that, if your work is of a high quality and it's evolving and you still have a collector base, then, then that's great. Uh, using Kincaid's example, he, his collector base was, was the masses. It was, it was QVC it was the home shopping network. And see, that was, that was a choice that, where the work literally was was based as a product. It, it's a dance, isn't it? I mean, it's we're, we really do have a, 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 a tall order, kind of trying to occupy both those spaces, maintaining our creativity, our sense of self, but then also being business minded about this and marketing ourselves. You know, and, yeah. and I'm glad you brought Thomas Kincaid into the conversation because a few years ago, I, I did a Q&A video on my YouTube channel where I was talking about my art heroes. And Thomas Kincaid was actually one of my art heroes. And some people, like, I actually got some hate for that. They're like, how could you like Thomas Kincaid? I'm like, look, I'm not a fan of his paintings, but that doesn't matter. Look at what yeah. this guy was able to do with his business. He is collected yeah. Yeah. by more yeah. people well, than yeah. any other artist ever, ever. Well, look, but more you, people have yeah. reproductions yeah. of his yeah. Christmas cottage yeah. than any other painting. <laughs> like, I, I don't yeah. care if you're talking yeah. about yeah. Van Gogh's sunflowers or his iris paintings or the uh, Monet's water lilies. Thomas Kincaid has them whipped in terms yeah. of art reproductions. He, uh, when he was at his, his peak, he was the most famous artist in the world. And what yes. that does is, is it levels the conversation yeah. and it allows people to talk about, then, okay, now what is important to you? Yes. Is, it, is it important to be the most famous artist in the world? Now, um, you're not putting Sargent and Thomas Kincaid in the same category, no. but yet they're both probably is equally known. All right. Yeah. Maybe Kincaid is still more well known than Sargent. But the, but the, but see, you got to ask you. You have to know what you want sure. and you can't know what you want until you put everything in the mix. And if you're if you're coming up and you want to make a living as an artist, you have to find those places. You know, and like, let me talk about let me talk about that just for a second, because of course. I'm in the I'm in the Western art culture. OK, Western art. Uh, in the 70s and 60s, the Cowboy Artists of America in this country created 
uh, a cultural environment that linked with history and with with mostly people in Texas who were in the oil business. In other words, they own ranches related to that. And what happened was, is you had this perfect storm of, 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 of painting Charlie Russell, Remington style, ilk, kind of uh, a little bit on the naive side of the painting a little bit, but yet down and dirty, cool, cartoony sometimes, cowboy and and then you attracted the, some of the uh, great painters, illustrators from the East. They came in and got, they evolved into the Cowboy Artists of America, brought another level of sophistication, and these collectors stayed with it. And where I came into being, you know, I mean, I was aware of this as I was coming up. I became a member of the Cowboy Artists in 2001, um, right at the end of, 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 of a period where some of these guys were starting to uh, pass on and become emeritus. But one of them in particular, Howard Turpling, had always been my favorite Western artist. He, he's still my favorite Western artist. He happens to be a really, really great painter. But he also gets a million and a half dollars for a painting. Now, how many living how many living artists get a million and a half for a painting? Okay? Now, but you see what happened was is that he was coming up in a, in a, in a cultural um, cocoon, we'll say, that, that it, was, it was all pre, uh, with, where, the, where the collectors and the artists all lived together, so to speak. They gained access to that as like, next to impossible. When I became a member, I was the first new member of the Cowboy Artist in four years. It was another two years after I got in before there was another new member. There's never been more, say, than 25 members of the Cowboy Artists of America. It, it, it's a, it's a, a c cultural anomaly and their marketing and the way they sell and the way they create their work is based on certain uh, standards that really helped bring Western art along. And it also gave birth to uh, Western museum shows. Uh, the Cowboy Hall of Fame has the Prix de West. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, then you have the, the Booth Museum, the, Br the Briscoe. Uh, you've got the Gene, Gene Autry, uh, uh, American Master Show. All those came out of the Cowboy Artists of America. Now, what's that? Why, why that's all important is, is that when you're talking about marketing, you're you you're making the assumption as an artist that most people, say you're a five, okay, if you're going to measure your your ability, and your goal is to become a ten. When you get to that ten the collectors are always going to be below the five to begin with. So they're going to be fours. You understand my analogy? They're buying your work before as a five. So what happens is you've got, you've wasted five points by coming a 10. They don't know the difference. Now that's being a little bit, uh, um, I don't know, that's being a little cynical maybe. But what happens to these folks is, is that they, they, they love the collecting part and they grow. Okay. But they grow first by understanding that it's the company you keep. They, uh, you, you're, you're part of museum shows that have prestige attached to them. And what happens is, is that as by being an exclusive member, I applied to the Prix de West for 10 years. When I got in, I was like, boy, it was like I was anointed. It was like with the, with the Cowboy Arts of America. Uh, one day I was not known. The next day everybody's asking, where the hell did you come from? Wow, you know, look at you, you know? Why? Because now all of a sudden I'm I'm in a cultural environment where I have at least one guy that's getting over a million dollars for a painting. Um, so how does that help? I mean, where I'm at, all I have to do is 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 keep my keep my nose down and go along for the ride and 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 make a commitment to to get better every every year that I'm in this. And to, and to, and to be and to, and to make sure that I give back everything that I take, and be grateful for for that for that for for that little leg up that I got. You see, I mean, th I mean, literally, you know, those, those those events that I got into, those cultural events that I was uh, that I was given access to, has really given me a great advantage in my career. Now that being said. I also understand something about the idea of being an entrepreneur too, because of my past life. You see, 
So when people ask me, so how do I do this? How do I make a living? <laughs> you know, in my workshops, I, my dad used to sell vacuum cleaners. All right. It, it turned out that one year in California, he sold more vacuum cleaners one year in California than anybody else in the whole state. So it wasn't like he just sold vacuum cleaners. This guy was a great salesman. And I and 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 he was my father, my father, and I grew up in in the in in that environment with him, and so I and when I grew up, I thought like he did. So I'll tell my students, if you if, if you if you really want to be successful at this, maybe you should go out and sell some vacuum cleaners. And of course, you know it's, it's they, they, they of course don't understand what I'm saying, so I have to explain it. I don't really literally expect you to do that, but it would actually help because. The idea is, is that once you create this heartfelt thing that you've created, that's so deep and dear to you, and then you put it, you put it for out to sale, get, it's a product. And once it's a product, you have to label it. You have to say this is what it is, and then you have to def, you have to understand your neighborhood, the the neighborhood that you're going to sell it in, and you have to find a way to present it to people. The same way of a vacuum cleaner salesman does. My dad was successful because he moved to Manhattan Beach, California in the late 40s, along with every other GI that was getting out of, out of the war. And everybody was buying houses. And the, what did the housewives need? They needed vacuum cleaners. So he sold Kirby vacuum cleaners. They last for friggin' ever. And so he f sold everybody a vacuum cleaner. And then he got into real estate because it was done. He knew his, his market was, was done. It's the same concept. You, you, Everything runs its cycles. Um, I'm I'm at the I'm at the beginning of a new cycle in my life and my career. Uh, mm -hmm. I've gone around the block twice. I did it once with my sculpture, then I came back in with with my painting. I had a built-in market for my paintings, and now I'm at a point now to where uh, I've reached that another level where I'm at, I'm getting at, at seventy, from a collector point of view. I've, I've got at least another five years to where I can probably uh, still create a lot of excitement with my new work. But after that, I have to I have to present myself in, a, in another way. And uh, because th it's a difference, there's it's not that people are just buying something because they like it. They're also buying it because they have permission to buy it. Having permission to buy it means that they can store their money in it. And there's a chance they can get their money out of it if they have to. You see, I really love this. But before I'm going to spend that money, see, I told you about my friend Howard Turpting. If I would have bought a painting of his for a million or a million and a half, it would have been it would have been actually a decent investment. It would have been one of the cheapest paintings I could, I could buy because I can pick up the phone and sell it for the same amount today. You see, it's ironic, isn't it? I mean, obviously, there's never any guarantee, but you have to forget the money thing for a second. You have to put yourself in a situation where the value is based on a certain level. So that brings us back to, to Mark Rothkow. It's the same thing. Mark Rothkow, $20 million, uh, that's nothing because your money is just being stored. It's, a, it's, it's always your, still your money. But now if, if you're going to buy a painting, a, a great painting where an artist is coming up, one of my favorite young artists today is uh, Jeremy Lipking. And he's, his prices are starting to go up, but he's still way better than where his prices are. He's you unbelievable. See? His paintings are unreal. Oh, oh. yeah. Oh, yeah, unreal. yeah, 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 yeah. And he's he's still a young guy. He's in his early forties. And and, uh, um, but you know, it's it, it's it's still it's is it yeah. is it is 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 it a safe? If he if his prices go up too quick, then people may using that expression permission to buy. They may not have permission to buy. They may hold back. Uh, I had a I, I was at a show and uh, I won't say the name of the artist, but there's there's two artists in the show. One was getting 125,000 for his painting, the other was getting uh, 40,000 for his painting, and they were asking me about uh, which was the best a uh, buy, and I says without a doubt the 125. I, well, how come? Uh, because the guy that was getting the 40 is 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 still coming up, and he, uh, the guy with the 125. Has actually been there for a while, mm -hmm. and his auction prices. He's had a few two hundred thousand dollar, two hundred fifty thousand dollar auction prices. Wow. So if you're looking at it from a perspective of being able to bring something home to where you psychologically really haven't spent your money, in other words, you haven't spent the money. The money wasn't a CD earning you nothing. Mm -hmm. Now you've got it hanging on your wall, 
you know, it's like that 63 Corvette that you just bought and you put it in your garage for 125,000. There's always worth the money's still there. That's I guess that's my point. When you're talking about marketing and art, if you can present yourself in a way where the money is still there, you your prices are going to go up. I want to. I want to. Br- okay, there's two directions I want to go here, and, and we'll we'll just we'll address one at a time because and I'm glad that you brought this in. And again, you know, from my perspective and the perspective of many people listening to this podcast, my my concern and my interest is is predominantly with people that are uh, coming up in the art world, just wanting to make a start, just want to kind of leap out onto the stage, whether they're older and they've had a career in a past life and now they yeah. want to be an artist in this new chapter, or they're young and up and coming and they want to leap out onto the stage as a younger person and making a go as a creative professional. That's one direction I want to go in. But the other thing, I, I, I feel compelled to ask you this, John, right now, because we're living right now through something which and I listen to a lot of alternative media. I don't. I'm not listening to mainstream media at all. One of my favorite shows is called the Richie Allen Show. Uh, he's a broadcaster out of Manchester in the United Kingdom, and he doesn't get a platform. Uh, you know, and he but he offers a platform to really extraordinary people. And one of them is a guy named Gerald Salente, who's uh, got this publication called Trends Trends Journal, which talks about the economy. Now, Gerald Salente was talking about what's coming down the line for us economically. And he said that this, what we're about to experience around the world is not just the Great Depression. This will be called the Greatest Depression. And when I listen to that, it sends chills down my spine for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. I know that this is going to hurt an awful lot of people. And I know that there's a few things that we know in the past where we can see from from past, you know, wh- whether we're talking about the Great Depression, the crash of the 80s, you know, the mm-hmm. real estate market collapsing in 2008, mm-hmm. these various blips on the economic landscape. What we notice is that art, jewelry, luxury cars, boats, uh, everything mm-hmm. takes a hit, takes a massive hit. However, mm-hmm. there are still opportunities out there. So some people completely lose their career lose their vision, lose their direction and drive, mm-hmm. and it yeah. just wipes them out and kills them. But there are right. others that are producing still during that time and are absolutely killing it. You know, because at well, the end, during yeah. some of these times, there are still some individuals with money. So let, let me ask right, you that right, first. Right, let me ask right, you that right, first, because right, what we're about right. to witness, I feel, is going to be a doozy. We've known that it's going to be coming for a while. And so when we look at this thing that's coming through, I'm thinking, okay, as an artist, what do you do? How do you pivot? How do you make sure that you're still relevant? You're still able to market yourself? Maybe when the market's changed or maybe the market that you were tapping into has disappeared. Where do you go? Mm -hmm. Well, to begin with, um, technology, okay? Technology is is, uh, what's where where wealth is going to come from. Um, we've moved past the old industrial stuff. Now we're into technology. Uh, you've got characters like uh, Elon Musk, you know, and, and uh, Branson, those guys. Uh, you have, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies. You have things like that. Um, the fact that there's going to be a, a, a doozy of a, of a depression um, it doesn't fit in that context. Um, I think I think the... Um, I think technology uh, shares in the wealth. Uh, I, I don't think that any models that we've used from the past, you know, like 1929 was a particular model and it did have to do with, uh, the, you know, the, the 20s and, and, and the ups and the, and the way that the stock market w- dealt with and, and all the things that came before it, World War I and had to do with the Versailles Treaty in Germany and and all these things, you know, all the, this, this this compression of really weird shit that um, that was just ready a, this, a super bubble, of course. Uh, and then you had uh, you then you had World War II, uh, coupled with the depre- the uh, the depression as the economy started to build. And what happened was, is all these companies that been been building airplanes or building refrigerators, and that's when I was born, and that's where I came out of. So I was still a baby of the industrial revolution, but now we're in this other this other phase, and uh, I think prosperity may look different, 
I think that uh, when you're talking about depression or whatever, you're talking about people that are going to that are suffering. I think there's I think there's less suffering. Uh, there's uh, the technology um, that just the way human nature exists. Uh, there, su suffering is something that doesn't doesn't work well in this kind of environment. There's that wonderful expression about the jungle being neutral. It'll feed you or kill you with total indifference. All right. It's up to uh, up to human ingenuity. Once you land in the jungle, you can feed yourself or you can get eaten by a lion. I mean, it's up to you. All right. The opportunities now are such to where there's never been greater opportunities. So the psychology of the mind, I, I was listening to your first po podcast and you were talking about uh, Jordan Peterson as an example. Um, Jordan Peterson is, is, a, is a very particular clear thinker who, uh, I, irony of ironies, just happens to make sense, all right? It's almost non-political. Uh, and it just talks about what, who we are, what we are, and how we make our decisions. So for someone to prophesize, you know, that, oh, the economy is going to be really suck, you know, well, it, it, it depends on how you look at that. Um, I happen to like, especially coming from where I came from, I came from uh, uh, some dumb kid with the dyslexia who didn't know shit in school, you know, to actually becoming an entrepreneur and making something out of myself. So I like the idea of of individualism. You know, I've always had a conservative bent. I don't like a lot of government. Uh, that's just in my nature. But I also know that I don't make the I don't make the rules of the game. What you do is you embrace the rules of the game and then you then you find out what energy you have left because you didn't use all your energy, you know, you know, the old jousting at, at windmills theory. You actually can do something about it. And you and you and you survive and you do well within it. Uh, not everybody that wants to get into the art world is going to be able to get uh, the high, the prices that that I get for my work. Uh, it, that that's another story. They can though if they choose to, but it means that they're going to have to look at it from a different perspective. Uh, I don't need a lot of collectors. Um, I was I was going to a show one year and I was looking uh, down the aisles of the of the airplane and I realized that if uh, if if we crashed, not only would I die, but all my collectors that have, that I made my living on are going to die the same moment I'm going to die. You know, there was about 50 of them on the plane, and that's all I needed to to, to make a really good living. I mean, I mean, you know, it's, you know, it, you know, my friend Howard Turpling, over a million dollars for a painting. How many collectors does he need, really? You know, and of course now he's 93 years old. He just needs one. <laughs> See, it's all relative, you know. It depends on what you choose to do. Now, I, I, I obviously I know really some really good artists who are not ambitious. They, they're, they're if they sold vacuum cleaners, they weren't, they wouldn't be number one in the in the state. They're just they're they're happy with with, you know, they're happy. They do they do things on a different level. I have a, a friend uh, uh, Scott Burdick. You know, you familiar with Scott's work? Yeah, yeah, Scott is one of those people who's a killer, great artist. His wife is wonderful, Susan Lyons, but they're wonderful artists. They have a different tack. Um, they, they, they just they live in 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 the in the cocoon of 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 loving art, and the money they need seems to just come to them, but yet they don't fuss over it. You know, I uh, uh, I happen to notice the difference because we we do a, we do the pre to west together. You know, the, the same show. And I notice that I'm the guy who actually has energy involved in, and, I, and I have a stake in whether my work is going to sell or not. He seems to be so relaxed and kicked back because that's not his game he's playing. And see, for me, it's a game. I have two games. I want to do, the, I want to do really good work. I want my peers to respect my work. And on top of that, I've thrown a little fly in the ointment. The fly in the ointment is, is, is that I also want to do well in business. And that creates angst. So I know I know that I have artists that resent the fact that I do well, because they're you know there's it's all relative. There's artists that are better than me that aren't making what I'm making, right? I mean that's uh, that's always going to be a true statement, no matter how where you're at. The best of the best. There's always somebody better than you. And guess what? Is he making the dollars that you're making? That has is almost irrelevant because what is good enough is just good enough.
and you can take it to another point. It just, it just turns out that I just happen to have a collector base that's used to creating, that's, that, 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 that they, their houses are more expensive, their businesses are more expensive, money means more to them, maybe. And, and of course, this is the other irony is that I learned about these people and it turns out that they're the most non-greedy people I've ever met. Most of these people, their whole point in life is how to give their money away. And, and to, that's a spell a whole nother thing, too. So it, that's also exciting to me to be a part of that. It's interesting. I, 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 I love hearing your perspective on this as well, because I, I seem to be when I'm when I'm listening to alternative media in particular and a lot of conspiracy theory stuff. Uh, when I'm listening to this stuff, I, I tend to occupy both this kind of. Uh, fear and anguish, but at the same time, I'm always looking for the opportunity. So I know like that things are going to change here. Things are going to be a little bit different, maybe get a little bit squirrely, maybe, maybe not. We're in for a doozy. I don't know. But I, when I look at this, I go, okay, well, the one constant that we had can see is that there's change, but I do know from the past that there's always an opportunity. I mean, people do well in all kinds of sure, different situations. Sure, sure. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's fascinating what you, what you're saying there. And I, it's it's interesting, isn't it, seeing all of the different games that, and the different modalities that artists sure. are occupying. I mean, there's more yeah. than one way to yeah. do it. I, I think, you know, back to what we were talking about right at the very start, it's almost like we need those hundred different words for art, like the Inuit have a hundred different wait, wait, words wait, wait, for wait. snow. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you're an artist. You know, I go, yeah, I'm an artist. And, and I know they don't know what the hell that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they don't have a clue what that means. Yeah. And... And then you know, then if then you go down the road of explaining what you're doing, and then before you get to the end of your explanation, you've you've diminished what you do to the point where you just almost are ashamed to even f go any further with it, because you know it, it's 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 indescribable. I have another story that I got to tell you because it's it's it, it fits both categories. Um, my literally my second or third year out as an artist. I got a call, uh, and again, the business man in me said, that, "Get yourself an 800 number, and have a credit card." You know, this is er this is early on. This is 26, 27 years ago, um, and uh, I got a call from Chicago. This guy says, "A friend of a friend said that I should collect your work." FedEx me some photos. It, uh, there was no email, nothing like that. You know, digital stuff hadn't wasn't really there yet. And uh, so I FedExed him the work. I, I'd, only, I'd only done three sculptures up to that point. He calls me back. He says, I'm going to be in your area. I'd like to swing by your studio. My studio was a big steel building. that was pretty funky. So I says, well, I, why don't you come by my house? So I brought him to my house instead. We talked. He looked at what I had. I like it. I'm, got, I'm, I'm okay. Shake my hand. We're off we go. And he goes, by the way, he said, I was, just came from the Mayo Clinic. There was a doctor down there that I attribute to saving my life. I'd like to buy him a gift. This sculpture that I just bought from you, this one here, if you got another one, I'd like to buy it for him as a gift. I thought, wow, this is really great. So here I here I, I sold three sculptures, then another one in the, in the moment. Of, you know, okay, so there's four. We're walking out the door, and he turns around again. And he says, you know, he said, uh, I have a friend who uh, collects another artist, and he really enjoys the process. He says, I would like to do that too. He says, "What do you think if you uh, it, would it be okay if you saved me number one from now on, and I will buy number one of everything you do? Would you would you do that? Okay. Now this is the fun part about this story was we just shook, shook hands and I took it for whatever it was, but this has been all those years ago. He now owns he owns number one of everything I've ever done. Okay. He's got number one of every sculpture I've ever made in my life." OK, now someone wants to know how to make it as an artist. That, that's what you call luck. OK, that was a fluke. OK, you can't reproduce that. But it was it, it created such a great story within the confines of who I am and what I do. And of course, this man, of course, has become more than a, a, a family member to me. You know, he, ironically, though, uh, I was afraid to talk to him for about five years because I was afraid I was afraid there'd be something I'd say that he wouldn't like. I thought this is too good. It, it just scared me. And but once I and once we got on that roll, we became very close. 
And and then what happens is is that was con- that connection helped me connect with other people. And then you then you you start realizing this whole thing about it's not and it's just not about the earth. See, and that's the, the other part about this is is that you know who he collected before he collected me? Nobody. I was the only artist that he collected. You know who he collects now? Nobody. Um, he's got a big place in, in uh, with the exception of he has a he has a big house in Mexico on the on the coast, calls the palace, and he decided it would be fun to trade art for stays at his, his place on in Mexico. And so now he has a collection of art, but he hasn't paid for any of them. He's traded stays, and that's his game he plays. So he's got Morgan Weasling, he's got, you know, all the, you know, he's got he's got all these these great artists, but they've all you know, and that's how he does it. So for him, my point is, is that it's not about the art, it's about the collecting. And it's about the relationship of the artist. He values me as a person. He likes it that I'm an artist, but when we talk art, that's not his world. You know, we talk really as much about his world as we talk about my world. And when I talk about myself, it's really more as a friend, because I know that his interest is not, you know, he's not one of these, he, a lot of people that, do, that start off as an artist, they assume that the collector wants to get a little part of the, of what is going on in the artist's head and all that. And it, as it turns out, a lot of them don't. Matter of fact, most of them don't. And most of them are not concerned about that. They just want to know that you care about what you do, you, that you work hard, <laughs> you know, that, that you're a real, you know, that you have good morals, you're a good friend, you're going to do what you say you're going to do, and, uh, and, and, and uh, they, they like the work and why you, why you create it and all your other stuff. It, it, it's amazing how they don't seem to be, at least in my experience, that doesn't seem to be the deal. I have so enjoyed this conversation. It has been fantastic hearing more about your story, about your art, about your philosophy. I feel like we could talk for days. Uh, We barely even scratched the surface here. So one day, hopefully one day soon, please come back on the show. I'd love to talk to you again because we haven't even gotten into the technical aspect of how you create your amazing work. And I'd love to hear all about that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Love to tell you. Awesome. It might take a while. (laughs) (laughs) well this has been a real treat thank you so much for being on the creative endeavor yeah you bet it was fun thanks now i really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the creative endeavor podcast and a huge thank you to john coleman for joining me now if you want to check out some of john's work make sure you find him on instagram john coleman art and on his website www.colemanstudios.com Now, of course, if you liked this episode, then hit that like button for me, leave me a comment down below, and make sure you subscribe to this channel, The Creative Endeavor. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. Those links are down below, but most important, make sure you subscribe through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thank you so much for stopping by. I look forward to being with you again in another episode of The Creative Endeavor.